Learning together, that is life. Lachaim. So we are preparing for a week ahead. Parshas Kairach, Gimel Tammuz in this week, the day that our dear Rebbe, physical passing from this world. So, the Torah portion, as it includes everything in life, personally and collectively, of course, has some kind of message for us for Gimel Tammuz that is important for us. So, when we look at the Torah, or actually, even before looking at <laughs> when there's anything in Hollywood, a movie, uh, whatever it is, usually you have the hero, you have the villain. All right, you've got the, the great superior individual, and then you have the one way down. And it depicts life either idyll uh, idyllic or, or terrible, abysmal. But the regular ordinary person usually, you know, uh, the everyday individual isn't so much depicted. As uh, Richard Nixon once said about a picture that was of, uh, of, of, of JFK. They see a picture of him, people look and see what they would like to be. They see a picture of me, they see who they really are. <laughs> well, I, if I remember, that's the way it goes. And in Torah, in a certain way, you can say that too. We have the holy people, we have Moshe and Aaron, you know, we have the, the Oves and the Yimois, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. We have Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, and you know, all these great people. And then you have those who were the adversaries, right? The villains. So now we have in the Sefer Bamidbar, in the book of uh, Bamidbar. So we have the rebellions of the Jewish people. So earlier we had the story of the golden calf, and, and we've had, you know, the the rife of the people with water when they wanted meat. And the last week was the spies. And uh, and this week we have Kairach. So we have, you know, the good guys and the, and, and the bad guys, so to speak, you know. Well, that's what the ordinary, regular guy <laughs> doesn't seem to get the same prime time. And right, how do we understand that ordinary guy? So hopefully today we'll get a little insight. So, this week's parasha. Massive rebellion against Moshe and Aram by their first cousin, Perach. Right? What was it? He wanted the, the, the high priesthood, Kohen Godel, wanted Kohen to replace Aram. And as we know the story, of course, the rebellion was put down and the swallowers were literally swallowed by the earth. And um, they got, I guess what you might call their just dessert, whatever term you want to use. But it, um, their Battle against Moshe didn't work. Second half of the Parsha discusses the offerings that the Jews were mandated to give as a gift to the Kohanim. First part of the second part was 
the challenge, uh, the the uh, the challenge against the priesthood. The second half of the Torah portion is about the, the ways and means that Aaron's priesthood is solidified, and that's makes up the the general, you know, for the most part, the Torah portion. So let's go into some detail. Torah's rebellion. So we said, you know, we know that he rebels. Why did he rebel? What was the motive of his rebellion? So the Torah opens up with an unusual term, Vayikach Korach, which literally means he took, Korach took. He took 250 men to join him in the rebellion, right? Which is not a, an appropriate way to, the term to use. Vayikach, and he took, he recruited, you might want to say, or something of another another terminology. He, uh, uh, you know, won them over to get them on his side, whatever the case may be. But the fact that he uses such a term, Vayikach, so it, it needs to teach us further insight into the tactics and the motive of Caleb. So let's take a look. Let us take a look. Moment. Okay, let's share the page. Here we go. So, Parsha begins, text number one, with Rashi's explanation on the words that he took himself to one side to be separated from the congregation to challenge the priesthood. Uncle is a tra the classic translator of the Torah into Aramaic, thus translated, he took as he split. He split from the congregation to create divisiveness. So, on a simple level, the word Vayikach is a rebuke against Korach, saying that the fact is what he did was, um, as a tactic, to split the congregation. And this is unaccept unacceptable. He split the people away from others and to achieve his goal. But what was his motive? What did he want? And as we have the motive of, of that he was battling for the high priest to be a high priest or but but what's his motive? What is his belief? So one of the Hasidic masters, Rabbi Elimelech of Lizensk, was a, a brother of Rabbi Zusha. He says that actually by saying Vayikach Korach that he took, that he divided, that his primary goal was to actually split. Meaning, he believed that the Jewish people should be split. And that doesn't mean he didn't believe in unity, but he believed that the Jewish people belonged in two separate camps. Korach believed that God intended that there to be two separate types of Jews. One type would be the Kohanim, the priests, who would dedicate their lives to Hashem, to holiness, to worship, and spirituality. And the rest of the nation would be the ordinary folk, and they would uh, comprise the other group. That's what he believed. And furthermore, he believed that they should remain distinct from each other. In other words, the ordinary folk wants me to remain worldly individuals involved in worldly matters. And they shouldn't try to adopt a Kohen lifestyle. He wanted that the Kohen Godel, the high priest, should only minister to the holy group and not meddle into the business of the ordinary folk. In his own words, As the words say, 
Karach's group gathered around Moshe and Aaron and said to them, you take too much for yourselves. The entire nation is holy and God is among them. So why do you raise yourself over God's people? Now, there's no doubt Karach is motivated by ambition and power. Absolutely. But this is deeper. This is a policy disagreement, a theological disagreement that he has with Moshe and Aaron. He felt that they were wrong. And his argument is the Koyan, the Kohanim, the priests, they live a very secluded form of life, a cloistered world. Therefore, that's why they're in business to promote holiness, to be spiritual. By contrast, ordinary people, they live in a, a worldly life. Now, he believed that it, the Kohen isn't greater than the ordinary Jew. They're equal. They just have different duties that God has given them. God wants the ordinary Jew to build, to be productive, to do things to improve the material existence of the people and of life. The Koyin, on the other hand, they were to be the spiritualists, but they should, but they should not um, one does not have to engage with the other. And, and a Kohanim should leave the ordinary folk and not to try to get them to dabble in holiness. Let them be worldly people. right? And believing that this is a sacred task that God has given them. So there's two different groups, according to Korah, that live in different worlds. Don't put yourself over the people. Don't make yourself greater than them. You have your task. They have their task. It's consistent with what God wants. The two groups should mix. And don't try to make the ordinary Jew in the image of the Kohen. And this is the Rebbe's words in this week's Parsha, in this week's Sicha. The Rebbe explains as follows in text number three. The coin is completely insulated from worldly affairs, exclusively engaged in sacred matters. As the Torah says, Aaron was separated, consecrated to, to the be holy of holies, he and his sons. This is especially true of Aaron, about whom it is written, he must not emerge from the temple. If so, Karach claimed, why do you raise yourself over God's people? How and why must Aaron's lofty sanctity inspire everyone to be transcendent and to separate from worldly affairs? The people's role is to engage in the world and to fulfill God's wish through this engagement. Sounds somewhat reasonable. So what did Moshe want? What was his perspective? He wanted that the priesthood, that the Kohanim, should inspire the people to greater holiness. Hmm. Karaf didn't want that. He felt everybody's got their line of duty. Each one is, is equal before the eyes of God. And that there's really no connection between them. The spiritualists are spiritualists. The materialists are materialists. Both are fulfilling what God wants and needs of them. And therefore, we need to make a split between the groups. So by By, by the Kohanim meddling in to the ordinary Jew and their uh, and their purpose would be taking them away from their divinely given task. Don't meddle. Don't come down and teach the people a different way. Their way is the way of the world. That comes from the words Vayikach Korach. Korach took. He separated. He took to divide. Not only divide that he made a rebellion, he made divisiveness, but his whole point was that there should be divisiveness or division, rather, amongst the people. So God had to demonstrate 
whose vision is correct? Karach Sarmaisha. And by putting down the rebellion, God made it very clear of his position. His position is that no, even those that are world engaged in worldly matters and that are not Kohanim, they need to be inspired by the Kohanim. They need to be inspired by those great spiritual leaders who can help those who are in a, in involved in worldly matters that it should be engaged and they should bring spirituality there. So this concludes the first part. As we said, the second part of the story is about the priestly offerings. Matnas kohuna, as it's called in Hebrew. After putting down the rebellion, God proceeded to make it crystal clear that Aaron was his choice and that their method was the approved method by God. So first God instructed Moshe to, take, uh, to collect the staff from each of the tribes and also Aaron and replace him overnight in the Holy of Holies by the Holy Ark. And the staff that God chose would miraculously sprout the next morning. Indeed, that's what happened. Aaron's staff sprouted almonds. And everyone therefore knew that Aaron was divinely chosen. To further, so that was to, that, that reinstate or, 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 or emphasizes right, in a positive way, that Aaron, he is the chosen one from God to be the Kayin Godel, to be the high priest, to be that holy individual. Furthermore, then the Torah comes and tells us about the priestly offerings. This is now to, to, to um, reassure that from generation to generation that there should be no mistake made that the Kohanim are chosen by God and therefore, what you need to do is bring priestly gifts. So what does the Torah give us examples? A portion of every, of every um, loaf of bread or loaves of uh, several loaves of bread that are made. So from that dough, you have to take, to take challah and give to the Kohen. Sheared wool, you have to give a portion of it to the Kohen. A portion of the harvest has to go to the Kohen. Many of these gifts are presented in this section of the Parsha's Kairach at the end. As the verse says at the end of the Parsha, all of the sacred gifts of the Jews set aside for God, I have given to you, your sons and your daughters. Again, this was to public, publicly ratify Aaron's position, right? That, and not just for today, but for all times because now would become the common practice that you had to give part of your produce to the Kohen. Therefore, recognizing the Kohen has a special place amongst the Jewish people, that the special one who is that spiritualist, that holy one uh, that has been chosen by God, and that for all generations henceforth, that that should be reinforced by the very fact that you're giving these gifts to the Kohen. Now, of course, that's not the only reason why we give the gifts to the Kohen, because the Kohanim did not have a part of the land of Israel. So this was their, um, their portion. And furthermore, they did the, the work in the Holy Temple on behalf of the Jewish people. So now the Jewish people are giving of their livelihood uh, uh, to the Kohanim. But together with that, it was making a statement. The Kohen is that special chosen individual that has been set aside for the spiritual duties of the Jewish people, and that should never be challenged again. Okay. But it goes even a step further. 
the fact that you have to give these gifts to the Kohen, the ordinary Jew, right, was to further reinforce the idea, idea that the two groups have to be integrated because they're going to have interaction. By the very fact that you have to give something to the Kohen means there's interaction. There's interaction between the two groups. And of course, by giving something to the Kohen, what are you doing? You're taking the ordinary and the mundane and rather than remaining ordinary mundane, it becomes holy. So that's what those gifts are. That the regular Jew takes from what he has, gives a portion of it, right, of the pre, uh, priestly gifts. And this, therefore, um, allows for the Kohen that they will use it for uh, holy purposes that... They're taking the mundane and using it. So now the interaction between the two further emphasizes the rightfulness of Moshe and Arain as opposed to Korah. Karl says, no, 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 no. No relationship between the two. You're two different worlds. You represent two polar opposites. Each one God loves. Each one God needs. But you, you, the two worlds don't come together. But by the fact that there's gifts that are being brought and given, and that you're giving something mundane and now becomes holy because the coin has it, so that brings to the or or emphasizes at all times, not just in the original generation that Kairuch was wrong and Mesh and Aaron were correct. And it will now emphasize that all generations henceforth that. You take from the ordinary to make it sacred. You take the interaction between an ordinary Jew that gives to the Kohen, the holy, sanctified individual, and from those gifts, they elevate it from mundane to holy. Is that clear? So, if that's the case, right, if, if the message here is ordinary Jew gives something to the Kaihin that will allow from the mundane things that you have to be elevated into holiness, which is a beautiful sentiment. And therefore, you give some of your bread, you give some of your grain, you give uh, some of your wool. Right. Well, maybe there's a better way to express that idea, and that is the animal that is consecrated to bring to be brought on the altar. The entire animal becomes elevated and is brought on the altar, as opposed to some wool, some bread, and some grain. And as you're taking an entire animal, it's consecrated to be brought on the altar, that the Koyen has to fulfill that mitzvah. Right? And, uh, and hence, that animal becomes a sanctified, consecrated animal. And through the work of the Koyen, is elevated. So if God wants to make a point that the ordinary folk, that they can and should adopt a more holy lifestyle, and 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 therefore, by giving some of the of their uh, of their grain, their food, their food, that it becomes elevated, you know, and that's what's important. And sacrifices would be a better metaphor for this. It brings out the idea more clearly, because the entire animal becomes sanctified, as opposed to just some of your bread, some of your produce. It becomes elevated and sanctified. Give something that you transition, you transform the entirety, which is an animal sacrifice. So why not make the complete transformation through an animal? Then that's the gifts that would 
emphasize this idea that the Koyen is a holy person. The Koyen takes from the ordinary and makes it holy. Ordinary person, ordinary animal, and elevates and makes holy. Why something that is only partially? First of all, what does that look like in this idea that we're talking about? Why only halfway, only partially? So let's understand. Is the, is the question clear? Yeah? Wonderful. So, in fact, really, this kind of touches on the core essence of of Judaism. Let me explain. There's a lot of talk about anti-Semitism today. And of course, it's an age-old hatred. Nothing new. There are basically two camps in how to deal with anti-Semitism. One is assimilate. If you assimilate, there won't be anti-Semitism. Right? That's what the Jews tried in Germany. And in many places, the Jews tried that. They assimilated, hoping that they would not be seen to be different. And that would lessen, mitigate anti-Semitism. The other is segregation. Separate yourself. Right. Become very orthodox in that you just focus in on the holy, on the godly, put a fence around literally and figuratively in your world so you don't let the negative influences enter. So anti Semitism, you're not going to really deal with it so much because you live in your own segregated community whether it's literally with walls or you walk the streets in the sense that you are walled off from others or whatever the case may be right so this is really kairach's opinion we have two polar opposites we have the kayin what do they do they segregate from the rest of the people because they're different they're holy their task is one of being separate from the people so don't get too close to the people you know it's not going to influence you well that it's going to maintain your holiness appropriately and then you have the opposite extreme right which is the vast you know a uh, vast spectrum of humanity they are not the kohanim they're integrated. They're vested in the material world. Right? They're assimilated into a material world. And that's how Korach saw the world. And that's how actually most people see anti-Semitism. One of the two responses. But Moshe, or, or as Korach actually had both responses, right? There are those that had to segregate the Kohani and those who had to assimilate in the material world. Assimilate in the material world doesn't mean that you forget your being your Jewishness and forget God. Right? Not that's what Korah wanted, but the two different, two different types of people, two different communities, and and leave be each one to be their own. But Maisha understood, and of course it was confirmed by God, that the true rule of a Jew is to bridge God and bring him to the world. To bridge that. The, the great um, um, schasm, if you will, that there is between the spiritual and the material, between uh, uh, godliness and, and worldliness and bring the two together not to assimilate and not to segregate 
but rather rather synthesize. That's what God wants. That's what Moshe wanted from the Jewish people. And of course, that's the reality of what the mitzvahs are. Their mitzvahs are there in order to teach us not to become spiritualists or not to become materialists, but that we integrate the two, the spiritual into the material. And this is the mitzvah of tzitzis, which was taught us at the end of last week's Parsha, the last aliyah, right? Tzitzis are actually the tassels, right, on the garment that you wear, the four-cornered garment. And the idea here is to bridge between the mundane details of life to God. And that's a holy way to live life, taking the mundane and being tied to godliness. Not as Korach wanted, that they should be two distinct entities that are separated from each other. One being the segregated and one being the assimilated, right? That's not what he wanted, Korach. But that's not what Tzitzis represents as As the Ram Saba um, explains in text number five, the secret of tzitzis is to tie and unite ourselves with God, the sacred first cause of existence. God is represented by the top knot, knot of the tzitzis and the one that binds the disparate pieces and wrappings that are located between the knots. The success of knots of the tzitzis demonstrate the many spheres of existence, each higher than the other. The top knot demonstrates that above all is the absolute unity of God, who ties it all together. Thus the Torah commands, affix a blue, a sky blue thread upon the fringes of on the corners. This teaches us that a singular supernal one, who is also described in Kabbalistic works, as the scarlet thread attaches, sews, and ties everything together with a single thread. He, the master of heaven and earth, combines everything and makes them one. As we wrap ourselves in the in the fringed, fringed prayer shawl, we remember the unifying knot and visualize our wondrous connection and attachment to the one God. This way, the human becomes part of God and God as a presence in this world. So what the idea of, in, in, in the mitzvah tzitz is, today we don't have the blue, um, the blue string. We don't have that today because um, we don't know what a halazan fish is, that in it is the dye, the, the, the sky blue dye that has to come from particularly that fish. Okay, so we don't have it, but the concept we do have. And what's the concept? Is you're taking this one string that ties the knot at the top. Uh, okay, here we go. At the right. It ties the knot there. And then it, it wraps around everything throughout, tying all of the things that are not blue. Okay. So what this means is that holiness and worldliness are not meant to be kept apart, right? Or should they be assimilated? R rather, the human experience needs to be bound up and tied up with God. And God is present in, in everything in our daily lives. Why? Because you're taking the blue string, which represents blue, the, the, the sky blue, which representing the heavens above, right? Meaning godliness. And that godliness now needs to be tied, wrapped in to the entirety of the tassel, tying it to the material uh, garment, four-cornered garment, meaning that you're taking the materiality of your world around you and you're tying it and binding it 
to godliness. So you're not segregating, you're not assimilating, but you're synthesizing the blue and the white, right? Hmm. Jewish colors even. Hmm. Blue and the white. Look at that. Yeah, look at that. Divinely orchestrated. <laughs> Boy, this class, this was red. No, I'm joking. It's always blue. <laughs> the heart was red. <sighs> and this is what Korach took direct aim against this concept. And he actually did that in his argument against Moshe. As the Midrash tells us, fascinating. Oops. Midrash tells us, Mekerach arose and asked Moshe, there's a prayer shawl made entirely of blue, uh, sky blue wool, requires sky blue fringes on its corner. Question, what if the whole garment, this is the Tzitz's garment, was all blue, sky blue? I mean, it's all God. It's all God, right? It's all segregated. It's only blue. So now do you need the blue fringes over here? Right? So he says, no, it does require it. Moshe said, if an entire sky blue garment can't exempt one from the obligation, how can the four sky blue fringes exempt us? How can if you have on the four corners here, blue on all four, how's that going to exempt? If the entire garment is blue. So what's he saying? On the surface, it sounds like a stupid thing that he's saying, but it's an, actually, this is the whole argument. He believes either or. If this is all blue, that means it's all godly. It means you're segregated. You're only blue. And, and therefore, you're a holy person. Well, then you've done the mitzvah, period. Then you don't need the blue here tied in with the white because you're holy. Right? That's what his, his statement is. And Maisha said, no, 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 no. You're missing the point. The point is not to be segregated all holy blue as the heavens above and to be a godly, only a spiritualist kohen, for example, right? No, but what we need to do is to take the blue and, and tie it in, bind it into the white of daily existence. That is what Judaism is all about. In other words, Judaism doesn't offer a binary choice, either God or the world. Judaism insists that God and the world belong together. There is no contradiction between living with God and living in the world. That's what we need to do. That's the mistake you made. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Okay. So now we're in a, in a good position to understand God's choice not to ratify through the sacrifices, but through the priestly offerings. Because sacrifices are not a good choice because they become entirely holy. And it's not the Koyan's role to reshape the people until they, until they become entirely holy. The Koyan's task is to help the ordinary Jew to be able to bridge 
a world of mundanity with godliness. That's their job. By giving a, a sacrifice means the entirety of the animals now on the altar of God means everything, right? Now you need to give it all up, the worldliness. No, that's not their job. But the priestly gifts align with this idea because priestly gifts means you're giving some of it that becomes holy when you give it to the kohen. You're only giving some bread. You're only giving some grain. You're only giving some wool. And part of it remains mundane. That's a perfect analogy or gift that resembles this idea of the relationship between the Kohen and the ordinary Jew. Um, as the Rebbe says in his own words, let's see from the Sicha. Rebbe says in this week's Sicha, offering a sacrifice or consecrating any of our possessions to God fails to capture the concept of transforming mundane physical items into divine instruments. It represents the idea of escaping all association with mundane worldliness and becoming sacred. By contrast, giving our mundane possessions as priestly gifts to the Kohen demonstrates the notion that the mundane worldly possessions can become holy. Right? So had um, God ratified Aaron's priesthood by presenting him the laws of the animal sacrifices, so that would have meant that the Koyin's task was to help all Jews to become like a Koyin. In other words, everybody has to give up being, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, a doctor, lawyer, um, an accountant, a uh, whatever, uh, a small business owner or, or whatever worldly activity they'd be involved in. And their whole task would be to inspire them to all become, you know, spiritualists, segregated from the world, you know, the world of Torah, uh, uh, the world of, of prayer. And that's it. Nothing more. There's no other world. Right. But the message that God wants to convey was the very opposite. The Jews must live in the world, not become part of it, don't assimilate, don't become part of the world, right? You know, to be separated from the world, segregated from the world, to become the spiritualists, but don't assimilate. Be anchored by godliness because you'll be inspired by the Kohen in order that you can now bridge the gap between a mundane world and uplift and elevate it to become a world of good, to change the world for good, to become a holier place. And the priestly gifts are a perfect analogy of that. Again, because you're giving from your crop, you're giving from your bread, you're giving from your possessions, a part of it. And the rest remains yours, mundane, but to be inspired by what you gave, that now you can also elevate by your portion, even though it's not a holy portion, inherently por a holy portion because it, get, it was given to the Kohen. But now inspired by this, and now your material life can be imbued and infused with a sense of holiness. So what's interesting, what comes out over here, In a certain way, the, um, the ordinary simple Jew 
is not so ordinary and simple. The elevated Jew, the holy Jew, the tzaddik, the rebbe, right, has a huge job to inspire the ordinary person. It's interesting. Their purpose, the, the, the holy person, is to inspire us. In other words, they're there for us. And what are we here for? Ourselves. To take the mundane of my life and to elevate that mundane. To elevate the mundane. So it ends up that the 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 Kohen, the the, 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 the spiritualist, the tzaddik, the, the holy roller is there for me. And I'm here to bring godliness into this world. Which is counterintuitive. We would think that the holy roller, oh, that, that person is much is much more lofty than I am. And therefore the purpose exists in them. But in this sense, it's actually the opposite. The purpose exists in the simple, ordinary Jew. Because it's them that can bridge from the highest heights of divinity and bring it to the lowest, lowest part of the material mundane coarse world and to bring into that world holiness by the holy roller there is no mundanity everything is is holy everything is beautiful but in our lives it's not that way we've got you know We've got a, a material world that we have to contend with. And to bring it in there, that holiness, in that sense, the ordinary guy is greater than the holy guy. And we all can do it because this is the true reality of each and every single one of us. This is truly highlights, says the Rebbe in this week's Sicha, the fact that even those who seem low on the surface are deeply attached to God, no matter their station in life, the, the true and eternal reality of every Jew is God. So that's our, you know, so that's our true reality. The difference is the Kohanim, the spiritualists, the Tzaddik, the Rebbe, they live it. They are that. They have transformed. There's nothing mundane about them. Everything is just perfectly holy. Segregated. Just for God. But not us. So they can't really bridge the gap. Because there is no gap by them. And not only that, what are they there for? To empower us. That we can make the mundane holy. So in some way, we are more sacred than those holy, righteous Jews. As the Rebbe says, Jews who live in the world have more spiritual stamina than those who are cloistered in the halls of the Torah study. The spiritual integrity of Torah students is never challenged by secularism because they are not exposed to it. We therefore don't know how they might fare if they were exposed to such challenges. In fact, says the Rebbe, it is because they are not gifted with the same spiritual stamina that God guided them from above to be cloistered life in the study hall. Not so the businessmen. The very fact that they face daily challenges indicates that they have the spiritual stamina to overcome these challenges. Wow. So again, 
intuitively we would think that the holiest Jew who is you know sitting in the in 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 synagogue in the house of study in yeshiva right you know uh, devouring in the holy books is the real is the real thing well they are the real thing because they are through and through living it however they don't have the holiest capacity because the businessman right who is challenged in the in a material world be honest not be honest you know make sure you study torah and, and not allow business to overtake you right the, the, the holy people are not going to be overtaken by you know oh i'm not going to study torah because of a business uh, deal that i'm involved in or it's coming close to shabbos and you know uh, i gotta sign this document before shabbos and it might run into shabbos and they're not going to be um dealing with such a challenge so means the businessman who has that challenge means he can overcome that challenge and therefore has this stamina the strength to do that as the Rebbe says the one who's sitting in the base midrash maybe doesn't have the power doesn't have the inner strength to overcome that challenge and that's why they are where they are so what comes out is that these worldly people who have the challenges of dealing with a mundane and sometimes an anti-Jewish environment, an anti-God environment, and to remain strong and, and true in the everyday struggles, that they live with God in the mundane daily activity that is very cherished and beautiful and loved by God, and in some respects is more dear to God in some respects, it's more dear to God. So, we stand on the eve of Himmel Tammuz. Night is Rosh Chodesh. Tammuz. And the Rebbe, who is the ultimate holy individual, who is there to empower us, to give us the strength that we don't segregate. That's the uniqueness of Al Chabad. Other communities, they segregate themselves from other Jews and other non Jews that are not of the same, you know, uh, lifestyle because of the fear that they will be affected by them. The Rebbe says, don't segregate, and of course, obviously, don't assimilate. But how is it that you can stay in the world and not be affected by the world is because we have someone who gives us that strength, who is, who's got that power. And by us, by connecting to that power, then as shluchim of the Rebbe, emissaries of the Rebbe, which an emissary doesn't mean like me that I, work and get paid by Chabad, right? But um, those who feel the connection to, to the Rebbe and by having that connection and growing day in, day out in that, through that connection, in one's connection to Hashem, you know, strong commitment to Torah and mitzvahs, that in that manner, we fulfill the task. We might be only the feet. The Rebbe is the head. But it's the foot soldier that wins the battles of life and wins the battles of war. It's not the generals. It's the foot soldier. So we're that foot soldier. Right? That um, wherever we are, in the trenches and dealing with whether it's a hostile in, environment that's hostile to Jewish values or whether it's a materialism that is hostile to godliness. It doesn't, it doesn't affect us because we're focused on the mission that we have and our mission is to bridge the gap 
between the mundane of this world and the things that we have that are of a mundane quality and to infuse it with, with, with godliness, with holiness. And uh, that's what we've been passed by, the Rebbe. And we have the power. We have the power to do it. So much so that we um, will most definitely fulfill the task and bring the final redemption of Mashiach now. Chai, Chai. David, I see you have a question, please. Oh. Oh, yes, sir, I find. Um, I just was wondering when Mashiach comes, is there going to be a big division between the mundane and the holy? Is there going to be a division between the righteous and the regular Jew? Um, how is it when Mashiach comes? Oh, uh, I mean, based on everything we just learned, it's the opposite, right? There won't be a division. That was the whole point of our of the Rebbe's teachings, right? So inherently, God cre God cre is animating and creating everything at every moment. So inherently, there's nothing that is really a divide, a division. It just appears that way. And our job is to bridge that gap. Right, that's that's our job. So, so when Messiah comes, what will our job be? Well, that job will be bridged. Right, we will experience that. What will our job be? Our job will be to further uh, accentuate. And instead of bridging the gap, is then elevating the inherent divinity that's there. Right now, it's inherent, but not, um, but not, not in a revealed, clear way. Right, Mashiach comes. There'll be a clarity, so we won't have to deal then with, um, we won't have. In other words, we we will not sense the mundanity and the coarseness of a material world we will sense the divinity of it. Our job is to do that now, to bridge that gap. And that's what a mitzvah does, right? That's what a mitzvah does. That's why the mitzvah of tzitzes is sort of uh, the mitzvah that um, is, is equal to all the other mitzvahs because it reminds you that it's a mitzvah to, right? That you should see them and that will bring you to do. Because what are you going to see? Okay, now we don't have the blue thread, right? But that's the idea of the blue thread, that we are threading through, tying through everything of the material world, the material garment and the material world. We're tying it up and, and binding it to the holiness, to godliness. So today we do it. That's our mission. Then we will more experience the results of our mission and do it in a way that it's an obvious way. Tim. Go ahead. Hi, Rabbi Frank. Hi. Uh, among uh, missions, um, Jews' missions in this world, it's uh, to serve Hashem. And also I have learned that it's to uh, bring enlightenment for other nations by uh, example, that uh, the righteousness, the Torah values, etc. So, and why? And you have uh, spoken about two extremes: uh, segregation and assimilation. And why? Uh, um, uh, why uh, Jewish people uh, don't allow and or ease a conversion for for uh, from other nations to be converted uh, to a Jewish? Uh, nation why it's so difficult to join jewish nation why it's so difficult it's why jewish uh, people don't ease this kind of uh situation and it will bring uh enlightenment for other nations and maybe uh we we can um remove, remove anti-semitism in, in this world by open opening and not 
um, like assimilate, but assimilate other people to Jewish nation? I'm sorry for my question. No, no, oh, no, you no, understand. no question. Excellent question. So, um, first of all, you see, every other faith, they are looking for everybody to convert to their faith because every other faith believes that they are the truth and the only path to God. Judaism believes we're the truth and the only truth, but that a non-Jew doesn't have to be Jewish in order to have a path to God. Non-Jew keeps the seven Noahide laws as they are based in the Torah, and you have a path to God. Absolutely. So you don't need to be Jewish in order to have a path to God. Every other religion, again, you need to be an adherent of that religion. Otherwise, you're gonna otherwise you're gonna burn in hell or or you're, you know, you're uh, an apostate and so on and so forth, right? So for that reason, we don't need to have anybody become Jewish. Ah, you want to become Jewish? Be becoming Jewish, though, is not about um, like being a believer. So, you know, if, if, I, if I just believe that JC is the son of God and, uh, and I bring him into, accept him in my life, so okay. So now I'm a part of that faith group and, uh, and so on, because that's all it takes. Because it's not a mem, because that's all it is. As opposed to Judaism, is a metamorphosis of being. You're becoming a Jew, which means you're becoming a having a Jewish soul. That's going to be um, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, a flame, a spark that's going to turn into a flame of a soul. And that's a huge metamorphosis. There's no greater metamorphosis of being than from being someone who is a spark of a Jew to becoming a, a full 100% Jew. No 50% because it's either, it's, you can't be 50% 50, 50 pregnant, you can't be 50% Jewish. Either you are or you're not. Now, sometimes I'm dealing with a case now of someone who, you know, got to figure it out, but um, but it's either yes or no. So in that respect, to become Jewish, that you don't need to become Jewish, that becomes very serious, that now if someone becomes Jewish, they don't observe Shabbos, there's a huge punishment in the last week's Torah portion, right? The end of the last week's Torah portion, huge punishment. I mean, today you don't have that punishment, but it's yeah, uh, today uh, we don't have that particular punishment, but it's serious. So don't become Jewish and not keep Shabbos. Better than stay a non-Jew. You, you know, you won't have that. So it's a kindness to the non-Jew that they should remain a non-Jew. Someone is really serious and keeping Shabbos, keeping kosher, keeping the mitzvahs, and is truly serious about it. Oh, okay. So then, first of all, it's a serious thing, metamorphosis of being. You are now imbued with a divine Jewish soul that God gives for a proper legal based in, a proper based in. I'm dealing with cases over here in Montreal of Orthodox Jews, and the conversion is not good. It's not valid. So don't be taken just because it's Orthodox. It's just very important. Someone's converting, don't do it with Orthodox. Do it with a proper, check with me first. Um, that, you did, that it's done properly because you're doing it. It's a serious thing. So you don't want to be that it should be questionable. It needs to be 100%. So, you know, that court of the based in, the based in is in, endowed with a power that through them, I mean, it's God who gives the soul, but it's through them that they, um, that, that, that this person gets a soul. So that's a pretty heavy duty thing, but it needs to be a very serious thing. So if a person's not serious about it, we don't need people in the club. We have enough people in the club that are not keeping Shabbos, are not keeping kosher. Like, you know, there's enough that we have to deal with someone to come and they're not gonna do it. What's the point? What, that you can have a serious punishment? Why do that to a person? 
So therefore, it's a serious thing. You got to be serious about it. And Tim, as long as you're living way far out, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. So to celebrate the ordinary, <laughs> no one does. But in Judaism, the ordinary, the ordinary Jew has a huge task before them, a beautiful one, and they're empowered with and l'chai, l'chai. Thank you, folks. For those who are joining TRC, we'll see you shortly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Shabbat tov. Shabbat tov. Shabbat tov. Thank you.